Hey everyone, Steven here, and today I'm reviewing the Innocen 34M1R Ultra Wide Monitor. As with all of my reviews, I'll cover these specs first before getting into what I like, don't like, and the gray area before wrapping the video up. With that being said, let's get into the specs. The Innocen 34M1R is a 34 inch 1440p mini LED VA panel ultra wide monitor with a 1500R curve. 2,304 local dimming zones, and a 165Hz refresh rate at a 1 millisecond motion picture response time. For color gamut, this covers 99% of the sRGB, 94% of the DCI-P3, 94% of the Adobe RGB, and has a delta E of less than 2. The typical brightness here is 450 nits, with the minimum brightness being 400 nits. This has a 3000 to 1 contrast ratio, and it's 8-bit color, although you can get 10-bit color if you drop the refresh rate down to 144 Hz, although that's most likely just 8-bit plus FRC, as they don't advertise true 10-bit color here. Your eye most likely won't be able to tell the difference between true 10-bit and then the 8-bit plus FRC, so it's not a huge deal unless you need it for content creation. This is advertised as having HDR1000, but it's not certified through VESA and no mention of the window, but my guess is it would be a 2% window here. For ports, this has one DP1.4, two HDMI 2.1, one USB Type-C that can deliver 90 watts of power and be used as a video input, and this has two USB 3.0 expansion ports as well as a headphone jack. Now the listing says this has HDMI 2.1, but I highly doubt that as it says that the cap for HDMI will be at 100 Hertz. So this is most likely a typo. This is probably HDMI 2.0, not 2.1, because if it was truly 2.1, it wouldn't have that cap at 100 Hertz. It would easily hit the 165 Hertz at this resolution and aspect ratio. Now, if you change that aspect ratio and resolution, if you turn this over to 2560 by 1440p, which would be 16 by nine, not the 21 by nine aspect ratio, you can hit 120 Hertz with that. So console players out there, if you wanted to have this and utilize a console, two things happen. And this is one of the reasons why I don't recommend ultra wides in general, if it's going to do the 21 by nine aspect ratio, it's just gonna stretch that image out. If you're okay with that, that's fine. If you don't wanna stretch it out image, you need to change the aspect ratio down to the 16 by nine. So you're gonna have two black bars on the outside of the image. Now, what I've noticed with the various reviews that I've done with ultra wides, some of them will force the image to stretch while others will force it to have the black bars on the side. With this monitor, it is forcing, at least with the PlayStation 5, to have the black bars on the side. So it's forcing that 16 by nine aspect ratio. When I went into the menu, I can't change it to the 21 by nine. So it would allow the image to just stretch out. So it depends on the monitor. Each of them seem to be a little bit different with what it's going to do and if it allows you to then change that. With this one, again, at least with the PlayStation 5, it is going to force a 16 by nine aspect ratio. And with that, you do get to hit the 120 Hertz, which you can see in the footage here up in the right-hand corner. Shifting back over to the specs though, this has two built-in speakers and a subwoofer, which I'll do a test for in a little bit, along with the built-in array noise canceling microphone, which I've never seen a monitor before. And I've seen it with laptops, but just not a monitor that actually has that with it. So I'm actually surprised that they didn't add a webcam considering that they have the microphone because you could actually have this as almost like an all-in-one streaming setup. Now, unfortunately, I do not have any technical specifications on the speakers or the microphone that I can share here. So I don't know the wattage of the speakers and the subwoofer for the microphone. I, I just know that it's the array noise canceling microphone. I don't know the frequency response, signal to noise ratio, anything. So you'll hear it in the test, but I just don't have any technical specs to give here. I've seen this problem with a lot of different monitors where they don't give you all the information. You have to reach out to the company. That's never in a timely manner, unfortunately, and I just didn't get that information back in time on this one. 
This does have another unique feature I haven't seen on a monitor I've personally used, which is the wireless charging pad on the front of the stand, which can deliver 15 watts of charging. The stand has a unique setup because of this, where you have these electrical pins that allow power to go to the wireless charger. So when you're setting this up, you'll notice that as you're plugging the stand into the monitor. This becomes important in regards to mounting this to a monitor arm. This does have a 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter pattern to mount it, but that does mean losing the wireless charging, obviously. For physical adjustments on the stand though, this has a height adjustment of 120 millimeters. It can swivel to the left and to the right 20 to 25 degrees, and it can tilt five degrees forwards and 20 degrees backwards. On the back of the monitor, you will find two strips of horizontal RGB lights that give this a nice accent of color. Next, I'll be covering the in-panel menu and some of the settings, but before I do that, let's get the sound test for the speakers and the microphone. So this is going to be a test for the built-in microphone. I'm sitting roughly three feet away from the monitor for the speaker test. I had the camera and that microphone about three to four feet away from the monitor for pickup there, just to give an idea of distance with both of these tests. The microphone here is actually decent. It's not gonna be something you could record content or anything like that with, but if you're only gonna use a microphone for game chat or if you do zoom meetings or anything like that i think this definitely will handle that it will suffice in those situations for the panel menu the button is a single button on the bottom right hand side clicking this brings up a dial with power in the middle to turn the monitor off inputs on the left brightness on the top home on the right and volume on the bottom as the default hotkeys that you can change if you want in the OSD settings tab of the main menu. Clicking on the home tab brings up the full menu and this setup here is a little different than other menus I've used in the past. The first tab is the professional tab and here you have the color modes listed first instead of the usual presets. Here you have standard, sRGB, Adobe, and DCI P3. All the footage in this video is in standard mode. Parking here for just a second, I want to cover the results from the Spider X calibration tool. Here, this shows 99% of the sRGB, 94% of the Adobe RGB, 94% of the DCI P3, and 91% of the NTSC. Solid results here as it matches exactly what is advertised by Innocent. After that, you have Gamma and then Color Temperature Settings, which has Natural, Warm, Cool, and then three user presets. In the user preset, you can adjust the RGB colors to your liking. The footage in this video is mainly on Natural. After that, you have Sharpness, Shadow Balance, Low Blue Light, Hue, Saturation, and Dynamic Brightness. If you have HDR on, none of these settings will be available. Next, you have the Picture tab, which has Brightness, Contrast, Dynamic Contrast Ratio, Contextual Model, which we will pause at this for just a moment because it's kind of a preset, but they've just branched them off from the gaming type presets. Here you have movie, reading, night, and care eyes. If you turn this on, you will lose dynamic contrast ratio and the aspect ratio changes. You can set this before turning on HDR, but you can't adjust it once you turn on HDR. 
and HDR kind of overrides all of these settings, so you actually won't see that there's any difference with this. HDR kind of seems to have dynamic contrast ratio built into the mode, just from what I've seen, because it's going to automatically use local dimming once it's enabled, regardless of turning that on or off in the game settings tab. So when you have HDR on, it is just going to use local dimming with that again you kind of get built-in dynamic contrast ratio to a certain degree because it's just making everything that is darker dim anyways by not turning on those many leds so you get something closer to an oled for hdr you have three modes standard movie and design no game mode, which I find interesting, but for all the footage here, I've left this on standard as it looks the best in my opinion. Next, you have the game settings tab, and at the top, they have the presets, which is where I find the layout here odd as they have other presets in the professional and picture tab instead of putting them all under one tab. At first, I thought this was separated because you could layer them on top of each other, but that's not the case. Once you choose any of the presets I've covered, it will disable the one you previously had on. Here though, you have RTS slash RPG, FPS Arena, and MOBA. These seem to really just adjust the color temperature, saturation, and oddly sharpness. RTS slash RPG mode seems to pull more towards a 2700K color temperature and then makes text and icons look kind of grainy and pixelated with over sharpness. Next you have adaptive sync which you can enable or disable and after that you have overdrive and I'm going to stop here for a second and showcase the UFO test. This has off, normal, fast and ultra fast. I don't notice much ghosting with this monitor in the traditional sense, but instead there is a lot of smearing and black trailing regardless of the mode. Ultra fast minimizes it, but it's still there. It's just subtle with the adjustment that it's making. I've left this on fast and ultra fast for the footage in this review. Shifting into the on-screen response time test results, you will see the one millisecond advertised response time is really more like eight milliseconds, which I'm gonna have a video from Tech Team GB explaining how companies get away with advertising one millisecond motion picture response times like this monitor and how and when undergoing testing, these never truly deliver those types of speeds. So here we're just seeing that average of eight milliseconds, but you can see in certain instances, it's actually worse than that. Now here, overshoot, we really just see one mark. It's 255 by 204, where we see a spike there that may just be an error potentially. But for the visual response rating, you'll notice a trend where the panel improves going from black to white. So in terms of the values, zero is pure black and then 255 is white. So definitely watch that video. It will help explain these results even better than I can. But the big takeaway is this isn't a very fast panel, more specifically when it comes to blacks as it increases response time when shifting towards whites. This most likely explains the large amount of black trailing seen with this panel instead of it pure ghosting as the response time with the blacks is very slow compared to the whites. After that, you have refresh rate and crosshair. Not quite sure why they didn't put that underneath a separate tab. Different monitors have different names for this, but essentially any of those on-screen options that you find, like the crosshair, you would find underneath this tab. You usually see that refresh rate, maybe timer on there but here they just have it kind of separated out in this section of the menu. Then after that, you have ambient lighting, which I won't cover all of the settings here, but they do offer a lot of adjustments. But I did notice they have front and rear color adjustment options, although this doesn't have front colors, so these are just grayed out. This is the standard menu Innocent uses with their panels, but I'm surprised they left that in though, instead of removing it to not confuse people. Last thing I wanna cover in this tab is the local dimming here, which you can turn on and off. No intensity adjustments, unfortunately, but I'll showcase footage of this working in real time so you can see the mini LEDs in action. 
After that, you have the picture in picture and picture by picture tab, which has a ton of options to suit everyone's needs. Another thing I just won't be covering all those different options in this video, but they do offer a lot here, which I like. Then you have the on screen display settings you can adjust. And the last thing here is going to be the other settings tab. With this tab, you'll want to adjust the volume up as it will be set to 50% by default. And then you have three modes for the sound, standard, game, and conference. This was set to standard for the speaker test and I've just left it on when I generally play. I've tested out the game. It does seem to have a little bit more bass. Conference is a little bit more trouble because it wants to highlight the voices with that, but I do like that it has the various options. Last, you have the wireless charging, which you can turn on or off, as well as the microphone, which is left off by default. So now that I've covered the specs and the panel settings, let's shift into what I like about this monitor. A little bit different than previous reviews because this will slowly transition into the things that I don't like. It just kind of does that naturally. So at a certain point, you'll notice there are things that I like that there's an upside, but also a downside to them. Starting specifically with just purely good though, I think visually this thing looks great in person, both HDR and SDR. So the colors here, the vibrancy of the panel, it does definitely pop. And so you have a plethora of settings that you can adjust to tailor this to your specific likings. With the various color gamuts, I like that through my testing, I found what was advertised is actually here also. That's not always the case. So across the board, this gets a huge thumbs up from me in terms of the SDR and HDR in regards to the colors, the specific color gamuts and the range that they cover here, and then all of the adjustments that you can make again to tailor this to your liking. After that, I do like all of the extras that this does come with. The speakers here, to me, are very good. I wasn't expecting them to be as good as they are, honestly, because a lot of times when they say that their speakers on a monitor, they're usually pretty flat, but this having that 2.1 surround sound provides really good bass and overall audio quality. Pair that with the higher watts here, and it can deliver very loud audio across the board. We also have the wireless charging. Again, I mentioned that that was more unique because I've never used a monitor that has that. I've seen some that do, but I've never personally used one. Here, the only thing I would note is if you have a very thick case on your phone, it may not actually charge. So it would have been nicer if it was a little bit more powerful, but it still will work. I do like the USB type C input with the 90 watts of charging power that also doubles as a display input because now you get to connect. If you have a handheld or a laptop, connect that to this and then easily display to it. And running the picture by picture or picture in picture, you can now run your PC along with one of these other devices very easily. One thing I did want to note is this does appear to have a built in KVM switch. So you can use your keyboard and mouse that is plugged into the monitor with any device that is using this for video output. I bring that up because there is no mention of this in any of the product listing. And this is a very nice feature to have. So a lot of good extras here that you may not find with another ultra wide in this price range, potentially shifting now to things where I mentioned it's like it's good, but it may come with the downside. I'm going to start here with the local dimming as it looks great when it works with a lot of different games. It may just make everything pop and bring this closer to the visuals of an OLED but I've noticed with certain games, specifically Dead Space, when everything is completely dark, it struggles. And what it does is it highlights certain things that maybe they're a little bit brighter on screen, but it can't quite differentiate the intensity that it should bring brightness to that, so it glows. And this glow just throws everything off. It does not look good at all. With this though, it doesn't do it for every single game. In certain games, it just makes everything look better. But I've noticed with very, very dark games, if it struggles, it doesn't look good. So I end up turning local dimming off to avoid this whole issue. 
which is a big bummer because I was excited to see Howl in a game like Dead Space because it has so many local dimming zones. I thought it was going to make everything just look way better, and it does up until the point that everything is mostly dark on the screen. And then again, it's just trying to bring brightness to these very subtle objects. And then for me, it just kind of tanked the local dimming experience because it's immediately everything is just this. It doesn't look good. So here it looks great when it works in certain games. When it doesn't, it just can ruin that gaming experience. So you turn it off. Now, once you turn it off, everything's fine. I don't like the fact that I would have to do that, though. So to me, it's like a double edged sword with the local dimming because this has a ton of local dimming zones compared to other monitors on the market. I mean, at over 2300, that is a lot here. And you can see how it is highlighting those objects. It's just not doing it very well in certain context. And actually another game that popped up was Destiny 2 when I was painting around the map and I'm on the moon at this point and you'd start to notice color banding on the horizon and with that on the edges, it doesn't quite know what to highlight there. And because of that, that becomes more noticeable that it's struggling with this. You turn local dimming off, you're not gonna notice this. But with it on, I did notice that one other area. Outside of that though, when this does nail down the local dimming, it does bring a higher level of fidelity and quality to the gaming experience. I just don't like the fact that it's having these issues at all. When in my opinion, with this panel, it just, it shouldn't be an issue. I've not noticed it with any other panel I've used that has this many local dimming zones. And I do want to clarify, I did try to make various adjustments to see if I could get rid of that. So turning down the brightness, turning up the brightness, going into the NVIDIA control panel, adjusting the gamma, adjusting the contrast and brightness there. None of these things change to this. I think having the option to adjust the local dimming to like a low, medium, high would have been a better bet here. And that brings us now to the response time here, which isn't nearly as good as advertised. Just kind of casually gaming. It's not something I really notice until I pop up like a menu or more specifically a map that I can move around. So I'm gonna show Diablo 4 here. Moving around the map, notice all of the icons. You have a lot of smearing and black trailing going on here. It is very noticeable. Shifting to in-game, I will notice it from time to time, but at that point, I'm kind of looking for it a little bit more. Now, if I sit back and just try to enjoy gaming, I'm not looking for these things. I'm just casually gaming. I won't nearly notice these things. Maybe every now and then something will leap off screen, pulling up a menu again, that would pull me out of it, but just not dealing with a menu, just playing a first person shooter, an action game, an RPG, whatever. It's not something that just stands out to me. This is where looking at this monitor, it's like, who's this geared towards? And I think it is more of a casual gamers monitor along with light content creation. I don't know that it's gonna suit the needs depending on the level of content creation that you're doing, but I think for a lot of people, because of the various color gamuts that this does have decent coverage with, it will suit your needs. Now for content consumption, this is a solid monitor, but you're looking at an ultra wide where a lot of content just doesn't display in that aspect ratio. If it does, it's awesome. If it doesn't, you get those black bars on the side because it's only going to display in a 16 by nine aspect ratio. So if you're okay with that, cool. If it's gonna be an issue for you, you're obviously not going to want an ultra wide, but that will be something that will be the same issue you would find with any ultra wide. With the local dimming, I've found with content across the board, it does quite well. I haven't seen any issues that I was seeing with games with content. I don't mainly consume content on a monitor though, so I haven't spent hours and hours 
testing that out in terms of trying to find if it does that or not. In general, just watching videos on YouTube and things like that, it's been completely fine, especially when I do the HDR testing where that does look at the black levels and then just making sure that the colors obviously pop when it comes to an OLED that transfers over to this. I'm not seeing any issues in regards to the local dimming when it comes to this monitor. Last, we have the gray area, and I really don't have anything here because this monitor to me seems more clean cut and dry when it comes to what's good and what's not good here. I do want to clarify the wireless charging. So I have an iPhone 14 Pro Max. I do have a case on it. You have to put it horizontal with that charging pad. You can put it vertical, but with that, it has to find that exact spot. When you do it essentially horizontal or parallel with this, it always makes a good connection. I don't know how it's going to do with every single case and phone on the market, but in regards to the case that I have in the iPhone 14 Pro, it will connect easily, but it is just easier in that horizontal or parallel position versus the more vertical, like perpendicular position. So in conclusion, this was an interesting monitor to review. There's a lot on paper that it has going on for it. Unfortunately, a lot of those big upsides, the local dimming zones, things like that, it just, it delivers on one end, but not on another, which was kind of disappointing. To me, it's just a mixed bag here. And the larger factor within all of this is going to be judging all of these things off of the price, which I've saved up until this point. The normal listing price is essentially $1,000. That's on Amazon, we look at it, and all these companies do the same thing. Hey, here's our normal listing price, but we're gonna discount this to this number, which right now this is basically $700. And then there is a $100 off coupon or code that you can use bringing this down to $599, $600. So at $600, looking at what else is on the market, it is a competitive space, even at that price point. At $1,000, no, way overpriced. At $700, I still think this would be overpriced. There's just too many options out there at this point. $600, I think it can hold its own, but it isn't going to be for the hardcore gamers out there. I don't think it's gonna be for most enthusiasts because they're expecting a certain level in regards to just overall performance that this doesn't quite deliver on in regards to the refresh rate, the response time, the local dimming. For casual gamers, if you're looking at everything and this has a lot of perks that you want, I think this would be a solid purchase for you. If you are prone to noticing black smearing, things like that, just keep that in mind. If you play darker games, keep in mind you may not be able to use the local dimming all of the time because of the issues that I talked about earlier. So this will really boil down to, are these extras that this has attractive to you? Are the various things that they're advertising with the local dimming and the 165 hertz refresh rate and all that, is that something that is not only appealing, but you're okay with potentially working through some of those issues, maybe turning it off if it doesn't quite work out. You don't really notice, again, the black smearing or anything like that. I think this would be a solid option to look at if that is the case. But for hardcore enthusiasts, hardcore gamers, anybody really outside of casual gaming and light content creation, I don't know that this is going to be the right monitor for you. Just too competitive in regards to monitors that are out there. Now I'm not gonna cover every single potential option you could look at, but I'm gonna give one example. And this is a monitor I've not personally used. It's been on my list for a long time. I'm contemplating actually buying this. This is the LG Ultra Gear 34 inch ultra wide. This is a nano IPS, one millisecond gray to gray response time. It is much faster. Now it's only 144 Hertz, but for 20 bucks more, you could have this. Look at all the various reviews online. Like I said, I've only heard really good things about this. This is a little bit older at this point in terms of when it launched, 
but this still has incredible specs. And when this came out, this was over a thousand dollars. Now you can get it for almost 600. Again, only what, 20, $22 more than the Innocent monitor, which is on sale right now. So there are other options to potentially consider. Ultimately though, I never like telling people what to do with their own money. So the choice is yours in regards to whether or not you are going to purchase this or another monitor like the LG one here. If you do have any questions about this, make sure you let me know in the comment section. I will make sure to answer that for you there. And that's going to wrap this video up. So if you like the video, hit the like button for me as it helps the channel out. I will make sure to have a link for not only the innocent, but this LG ultra gear in the description. If you want to check those out and potentially pick them up. And if you want to continue to follow along with all of my content, like any of my upcoming monitor reviews, make sure you hit that subscribe button for me. And as always, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.